This is the eLearn Podcast. If you're passionate about the future of learning, you're in the right place. The expert guests on this show provide insights into the latest strategies, practices, and technologies for creating killer online learning outcomes. My name is Ladek, and I'm your host from OpenLMS. The eLearn Podcast is sponsored by eLearn Magazine, your go-to resource for all things online learning click-by-click how-to articles, the latest in edtech, a spotlight on successful outcomes and trends in the marketplace. Subscribe today and never miss a post at elearnmagazine.com. And OpenLMS, a company leveraging open source software to deliver a highly effective, customized, and engaging learning experience for schools, universities, companies, and governments around the world since 2005. Learn more at openlms.net. Hello, everyone. My name's Ladek. This is the eLearn Podcast, and I'm coming to you from OpenLMS. And my guest for today is David James, who is the Chief Learning Officer at 360 Learning. In this very analytical conversation, David and I talk about how he started as a trainer around finance and banking, but then evolved into running learning, talent, and organizational development for Europe, Middle East, and Africa at Disney and how along the way he tracked changes happening in training delivery around data and technology that have led him to his current role. We also talk about how learning in an organization is linked to its culture and the tragedy behind all of the spend on education that typically happens at a company that just isn't relevant or missing the mark entirely. We also talk about why the bribes of things like gamification don't really help. We also talk about why today presents the greatest opportunity in history for delivering the right learning to the right person at the right time. And and it's not about your platform, but your ability to uncover what your learners actually need. David and I also talk about what data and evidence-based practices actually look like when they're used effectively and why using analytics from learning platforms is basically something like a postmortem, and why learning needs analysis is totally defunct in today's world. We also talk about how to move past the typical training request of executives and managers to be able to identify what isn't working in your company, what's the cost of not solving the problem, and then building the training around that to actually come up with a solution. We also talk about what to do about people who are just looking for training as a band-aid or a feel-good benefit, and how continuing to deliver this is both corrosive to your company, uh, and P.S. many times, this is your CFO who's asking for this, and how building this muscle dramatically grows the value of the L&D role. David also explains why collaborative learning is a process that allows L&D professionals to facilitate learning about anything in any company in any context. He also explains why the way training is delivered today in most companies still results in incredible amounts of wasted time, money, and effort, and gives a shout out to two great books, How People Learn and The Great Training Robbery. We also talk about why analysis is one of the hardest things to sell in training, especially to executive leadership, and why you might consider selling other things around training and simply including that in the process. We also talk about how we can get everyone comfortable with working with the numbers and the analysis required to understand the problems that need to be solved. And then finally, we talk about how to deal with the pushback that you ultimately will receive around change and the inevitable question for managers and staff of, what do I do with the things that I'm used to doing or I'm currently doing in order to shift to data-driven learning? And remember, We record this podcast live so that we can interact with you, our listeners, in real time. So if you'd like to join the fun every week on LinkedIn or Facebook or YouTube, just come over to elearnmagazine.com and subscribe today. Now, I give you David James. How are you, David? I'm very good. I'm very good. Thank you very much. Yeah, delighted to be on the show. Yeah, no, it's it's fantastic to have you. David, you are the Chief Learning Officer at 360 Learning. Um, we've been lucky enough to have one of your other colleagues, um, Jonas, uh, in the summit actually last year, uh, mm-hmm. where we talked about collaborative learning, which was really exciting. Um, and so I'm really excited to kind of continue that conversation and learn where 360 learning is today and also talk about what you're passionate about, which is you know, data, which is the L&D profession itself and um, where we're going with things. And I see that you have a guitar in the background. I do. I do. Yes. 
I feel like we all play the guitar at the end of the day. <laughs> I need to put one. I need to put one in the back here because I, I too am a guitar player. Um, as I do with everyone though, David, why don't I I want to just sort of step aside real quick, give you the, you know, the 30, 60 seconds of who is who is David James, um, and sort of give us your background and what you're doing at 360. Yeah, fabulous. Uh yeah, so um uh, I've been in learning and development for, uh, for for the best part of 25 years. I started in the late 1990s uh, as a trainer. Um, uh, I was fortunate to uh, to have an opportunity uh, to grow my skills as I grew a function as in a standalone uh, role. I, I, I advocate you can have an, an enormous amount of fun uh, when the uh, when the reins are off and uh, uh, and you can uh, build something that wasn't there before. Uh, but uh, but I felt then as if I really need to uh, to test myself, and so I joined a larger learning and development team. Uh, so so my my uh, my whole career to that point was in finance and banking uh, in London. Uh, but uh, but I fancied a change when uh, when somebody approached me and asked me whether I'd like to uh, to join Disney on a short term contract. Uh, I took the risk and uh, and I thought, okay, let's uh, let's give it a go. Um, and eight years later, I was running learning talent and organizational development for Disney uh, across Europe, Middle East and Africa. So it's funny how a three month assignment can turn into uh, an eight year career. And I decided to get out before I became a lifer. Um, I was no, just going to say, you know, I've, I, I have to interrupt you there because I have met some of the Disney lifers in Florida and California. It is a, I'm not going to use the C word, but it is, it, it can get very serious about yeah. people who are lifers at Disney. It's amazing that, that, that universe that, so anyway, yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah, I know people who've got their, uh, their, I mean, you, you get a, you get tattoos, a you got to get your tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get a pin for being there, uh, five years. I think you get a slightly larger pin for 10 years, but I know people who have got their 25 year trophy. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so <laughs> uh, it really it is a place where, uh, where, you know, people, people go there and stay. It's, uh, it's quite, quite a lure. Uh, and I'd say that, that during that time was, uh, you know, I joined in 2006 and left in 2014. And to say that the, the, the entire business model was turned upside down is an, an understatement. Mm. When I joined in 2006, home entertainment, which was box sets and DVDs, was the most profitable division uh, in the company. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't surprise you if I told you that box sets and DVDs became the least profitable division when I left in 2014. And everything between that was uh, uh, was was also shaking up, uh, driven by, by changing consumer demands. So uh, their need for learning and development during that time was uh, was extraordinary as the, uh, the business model and functions stretched and changed, uh, integrated, uh, and decentralized we were we were a team in demand mm. um but uh, but i left there as i said in 2014 and i left there frustrated if i'm absolutely honest because uh, i spent um, the best part of a decade trying to push technology onto people uh, without it actually working and, and i thought we we can't do learning and development for thousands of people without smart or or useful technology um, and a large proportion of my time, if not a disproportionate amount of time, was spent trying to drive traffic towards platforms and content that people just would not go to. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. I thought that there was a there, there was an opportunity outside because tell me if I'm wrong. You know, we we go to Google and YouTube when we need help. I mean, there's no there's no reticence to use technology, but people are smart and people are intolerant of things that they think are going to waste their time. Mm -hmm. So I left there to, uh, to, to try to bridge that gap between uh, people and technology. Uh, and that's what I would, first of all, did at Loop and, uh, and what, what I do now in 360. Fantastic. What, so I want you to take me down there. So when you say you, you put technology on the table, is it devices? Is it, you know, standalone courses? Is it, you know, trying to find learning on demand? Like, What's been the evolution there? And like, where do you stand today in terms of technology? Because uh, it almost sounds like at the end there, like you've you kind of said, hey, look, platform, not necessary. We've got Google, we've got Facebook, you know, we've got YouTube. You know, maybe, maybe it's let's let's support the learner rather than build a platform for them. What do you like? But but maybe I've got that wrong. Yeah. So 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 my ethos here is that uh that um First of all, Google and YouTube are great, and I couldn't do nearly all of the uh, the, the home renovations that I've done without <laughs> them. But they know nothing about my company, and they know nothing about any company that I've ever worked with. I'm a firm believer 
that at least 90% of the development required in organizations is linked to culture. Everything mm. that emanates from how do we th do things around here? Uh, and I think that that's absolutely core. But, you know, it's really difficult to sell. So the market don't sell it. Uh, and, I th and I also think that, um, uh, that, that, that cracking learning technology is really easy. That, uh, that um, when you're adding bribes to existing content, you've already lost. People are smarter than that. But if Give you me an example of that. What's bribes to existing content? What, what bribes, does that mean to you? gamification, leaderboards. Ah. Mm -hmm. um, it is new and novel delivery mechanisms that try to lure people in through, um, through it being novel rather than it being useful. Because we believe that if we have 10 million pieces of content within, a, and when I say we, learning and development, if we have 10 million pieces of content and we have 100,000 learners, then there must be something for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. We bet the house on that. We mm -hmm. spend our budgets on it. But the only problem is, is that, that, that it doesn't speak to, to roles, departments, uh, culture. It doesn't speak to customers, clients, stakeholders, um, norms and practice. It, it doesn't speak to roles. It just speaks to education. And so we, we, we spend budgets on, uh, on, the, on these big bets that, uh, that, that employees themselves uh, are largely apathetic to. Um, but, but what it comes down to it is, so, so I am a huge believer of technology and I believe that we, we all are all capable of a great deal more because of it. But instead of the bribes, what I believe it comes down to, and my track record of this but, uh, over the last decade has shown, is that if you help people with what they need in the context of what they're actually doing, when they need it, bingo. Mm. They engage. And then the conversation does, isn't then about how do you get people to engage in learning technology? It's now that we've got them, how do we help them to do the things the organization needs them to do? And then you can do that at scale. But if you don't seek to understand what it is that people are trying to do and what they're not able to do without your help, then you can't help them. And everything else is a big bet. And I mean a bet because you're, you're, you're trying to rely on pretty platforms full of uh, engaging content, but that engagement isn't what's actually required. It's the useful stuff they need when they need it. And when you break it down, first of all, what I'd say is that's really hard to sell, but learning and development people who get it are doing this and they're doing this cheaper, faster, and more effectively than the people who, who perhaps are behind the curve a little. Hey there. Thanks again for joining me for this episode of the eLearn podcast. I'm jumping in here quickly to request that if you like what you're hearing, if it's valuable, if it's fun, if it's informative, you know, if, if you're really enjoying what's going on, please do me the favor of subscribing to the podcast on your favorite player. Whatever you're using now, just, just hit subscribe. And I encourage you to join my future conversations live every week on YouTube, Facebook, or my LinkedIn feed. Thanks in advance. And now back to the show. Mm. I, I, I love that there's so much to unpack there because the first thing that you think of as an L&D professional when you know you put that statement on the on the table is that what role do I have? But it, it, you know, in my mind, as the, my 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 mind it, it, it always looks at that like wow the the opportunity for somebody who is an L&D professional or who's a learning professional um, this is an even greater opportunity than than before. Because before no. it was like, how do I find that giant volume of stuff that I put on the table that I put in that platform? Now this is like, how do I get specialized? How do I, you know, meet those learners with what they want when they want it? You know, would you agree that this is an actually even almost a meatier opportunity than than what they had before? I, I think this is a, a greater opportunity, yeah. Because I think that uh, that for too long we've been stuck in uh, administration and delivery mode. Uh, and whilst we've been uh, we've been hamstrung by by so much administration, I mean, I think the most dystopian job title in our profession is LMS, LMS administrator. I mean, what a job! You work for this dumb co uh, computer. I mean, that's what it is. It's so <laughs> dumb. It needs people working for it. Uh, but but I, you know, I'm hoping we're seeing the end of those days because um, uh, smart technology should be eradicating uh, the administration. Uh, and elevating the status of learning and development. And that's what I am actually seeing. 
But I think the absolute like, critical part of this, it's not about the creation of content. It's about understanding what the needs are. And data and evidence-based practice has always already re uh, revolutionized uh, other job roles and other job functions. And I think it's landing in learning and development and revolutionizing our impact. So now, and I know this is a, a, an area that you wanted to speak about today. We had talked about this in the green room. Tell me about what data and evidence-based practices look like to you from the L&D perspective, because I, I, I think many people listening right now, you know, many of our colleagues are going to say, look, I, I've got the data from my LMS. I've got the data from, you know, I've got the clicks. I've got the time, you know, time viewed of the video. I've got the completion rates, those kinds of things. What does it mean to you and how do we evolve it and use it to our advantage? Okay, so what you're describing there is the post-mortem. It is, okay, the patient's dead, right? <laughs> so, right? so what did it die of, right? But, but, if, you, but if you actually, uh, do, if you engage in the right conversations at the outset, the patient need not die. Mm. So, so in data and evidence-based practice, first of all, it's recognizing and understanding critical points of failure in your, your organization's operation. So, so, uh, and the evidence is simply seeking um, uh, uh, to understand from the perspective of the people we're expecting to influence what they're trying to do and what they're not able to do efficiently. Now, uh, this is it, it, this replaces the learning needs analysis. The learning needs analysis is dead. There's no point in doing it anymore. It was a resource allocation exercise because learning and development used to take so much time and cost so much money. It doesn't anymore. Mm. And if it, it's, and if it is the way you're doing it, you're doing it wrong. So, so the data and evidence-based practice is taking the same requests from the same uh, stakeholders, the ones that say, hey, could I have some training? And instead of saying, yeah, what would you like in the training? Or who would you like on the training? Or when would you like the training? It's, uh, it's saying, what is it you're hoping to achieve with the training? Uh, what's not working now that needs to work better? What's the cost of doing nothing, right? So you're having a big conversation only about the things that, that your stakeholder should be invested in. Uh, so you, so if if this is a true need, then, you, then your data is the very next question. It's the killer question. Brilliant. Show me. Mm. Right? If this is such a big deal, show me. Show me you're missing those SLAs. Show me that you're that that we're losing good people. Show me that we're hemorrhaging customers. Uh, you know, show show me how this is actually a critical point of failure. So you'll get the data. Uh, that data might be over a long window or a short window, but you want to drill down into it to find out what that's actually telling you. Can the, let, let me so let me just interrupt you real quickly there. Who is responsible for showing you that? Is you're saying the learner is is coming up and saying, no, look, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm missing I'm missing SLAs every week, and I'm unable to answer tickets, and I'm this and that. Or who's is this? Or is this now the meat of the L and D expertise of saying? I'm not, I'm not who, who's responsible yeah, good for question. Showing. Good question. Because what I'm not saying here is this is this is an upside down granular learning needs analysis wherever where it's a free for all uh, leads analysis. It's really not that. This is your stakeholders, your uh, your uh, business heads, your uh, your leadership, the people who are asking for your help, back, like who are asking for your help now, the ones who say, look, I could do with some training for my first line managers. Though these are the people. So you would have been engaging in a learning conversation with them before, but this time you're only interested in what those people are accountable for and the results that they're not getting uh, right now. So you, you've got to move past the training request. Uh, and the way you do that is you, you say, yes. So, so you say, Stephen, can I, can I have some, uh, some training for my first line managers? The answer is yes, absolutely. Right, before we get, get into the nuts and bolts of that, what is it that you're hoping to achieve with this? Mm. Right, there yeah. are going to be so many curveballs. This is, I mean, because because people are used to getting the training they ask for. The only problem is that training rarely led to significant difference in the way people worked and the results they got. And the reason is is that you can't possibly affect the work if you don't know what they do. Otherwise, you know, we we, we rely on too much on luck, hope, and osmosis. Sure. I'm afraid. I'm not. I'm, I'm not a believer. I'm not superstitious. So, so I believe that you can't affect the work unless you understand the work. So, what we want to want to do is we want to find out what is it that these people are expected to do that they're not able to do. Um, what what is the cost of doing nothing here? So, we want to get right down into the very reason, the genesis of the thought that these people needed help. Eighty percent of the time, leaders and managers have got where they are for a good reason. They're savvy. They're smart. You can talk to them on their level. 
uh, and you can get past the, the, the training request to the actual reason they engaged in the conversation. 20% forget it they just want the training the way i the way i describe it Stephen, is that uh, um uh, i've got an eight-year-old daughter if she falls over and she bruises her leg she'll ask for a plaster i take a look at that and i say it's not bleeding and i know she just wants a plaster to make her feel better and i give her the plaster 20 percent of stakeholders will say i want training for my middle managers mm. and you'll go what's the outcome you're looking for i go no 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 I want training for middle, middle managers. And then so you go to your, your first aid kit. You get a plaster out, but you go for the cheapest, easiest one you can apply because you know it doesn't matter because they're, because it's a non-problem and you just mm. want people to feel better. But if you've got a stakeholder and there is a critical point of failure in their operation that they need your help with, then they'll engage in that conversation. So you've got your data. And then you, what you want to do is you want to take that data for the people who are responsible for it and accountable for it. These would have been your attendees. These would have been the people that you said at the end of your training course, nothing will change if you don't apply what you've learned today. What will be the one thing you've learned from this five day course that you're going to look to apply? Like, seriously, we used to say that stuff. But but so what you're doing is you're showing them the data that they're accountable for. And you're saying so things aren't working out the way that, that, that are they're expected to. But luckily, I'm here to help. I need to know what you're trying to do when you're when you're doing this work. And what you're not able to do efficiently or effectively right now, like let's talk so, about all so of this. I got, and I got uh, this is awesome. I love yeah. this conversation. So, but I've, I've so two things that I want to talk to you real quick. Mm. One is that twenty percent that need the plaster, yeah. right? Haven't you just identified a a cancer? You know, haven't you just identified you know sort of a a part of your organization that is just cogs? In a, and do you want that? Maybe your organization needs cogs. I don't know. But like, have, have in your experience over the last 10 years, are these people that we finally, you know, we, that we maybe have just identified that maybe need to matriculate out and, you know, we need to find a way to, you know, bring in, you know, some fresh blood there? Or do I have that wrong? Like the, 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 every business kind of needs that they're, maybe they're a glue or something that, that holds the organization together. That's a really good question. And some of those people are perhaps should be moved on because they're just greasing the wheels instead of having the tricky conversations or actually managing their palming it off onto l d but i can also tell you from my experience of actually being in l d sometimes that's your cfo the cfo's already sold training so by the time they get to you and say i want training mm -hmm. they've already sold it to the people that that they want to attend it so when you say what are those outcomes they're already looking and thinking Oh, no, no, no. I think what I think what you're trying to do is consult. I just want you to deliver. And I've had that. I've had those conversations. And some people just won't be moved. And there are too many people in learning and development because we can't demonstrate our value. We don't have a lot of currency in the organization or influence to say, hey, Bob over there, he's, you know, he's uh, uh, he needs to be cut adrift because he's not adding the value. We, we don't have that currency. We develop that currency if we're affecting the work and we're doing that in a predictably uh, predictable and reliable way. I was just going to say, um, yeah, we, we've got to, you got to take us there. Because, and is, is that a part mm -hmm. of the, the, the data conversation that you're saying? So this takes me to the second question where if we're showing up to that conversation saying, look, show me what you want to affect, like what's going wrong and what, you know, how do we want to affect it? It almost sounds to me like the L and D professional, your, the, the real job. And maybe it's always been, this is just facilitating the move facilitating the, the behavior change, right? And I'm saying that in the, the most um, generous way possible because you and I, I mean, I, I, I'm not, you know, I don't know anything about fixing engines or I don't know anything about fixing, you know, the, the customer service protocols for my company. But, but if you tell me there's a problem, I, I can facilitate the problem that you see and you probably already know the solution, but we just got to get you there. Do I have that right? Or am I missing the boat on that one? Yeah, that's a part of the puzzle. That really is. And that leads us to the collaborative element of, uh, of, of collaborative learning, that, that if we know what the problem is, then we can all work together in order to, to solve it. Mm -hmm. So, But the beauty of this approach is, is that you're right next to your stakeholder. You've had a conversation with data. Between you and your stakeholder, you realize what the problem is. You know, you, the data tells you. So what you're doing is then you go to the people who are accountable for the work with your stakeholder, and then you uncover that. And then what's going to come out is, uh, you know, as you said, it's not it's not going to be learning. There's going to be stuff around processes. There are going to be systems. There's going to be a technical element. It could be relationships. Uh, there could be communication. All of these things. 
But unless you have the conversation about what it could be, you can't get there. So, so there'll be certain parts. And it doesn't take a bold L&D uh, person to be going, uh, process, that's not me. Um, oh, <laughs> systems. Oh, <laughs> like, <laughs> but again, I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to be the L&D person like going, oh, yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that. I mean, how much, how little credibility or, or confidence do you have in yourself to think that you are the order taker with all of that? But, mm. but what I'm saying is that 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 this data and evidence based practice truly unpacks what's actually going on. And then who's responsible for that is a different matter. But if you're right next to your stakeholder, you who you've built more trust with because you're interested in talking about solving the real problems, then you are further down the line. And then you've got that collaborative element. So if you've got so so if you think that you're a facilitator who's going to help to connect with the right um, the, the people responsible for the work with the right expertise uh, in order to increase their capability, then then the, the rest of this is just a collaborative exercise as well. But again, don't don't take on more than you should. Uh, your stakeholder doesn't expect you to be taking on uh, all of this stuff. They expect you to be representing learning and development and to be working on the uh, the knowledge gaps and the uh, uh, and the skills gaps. Uh, to to increase the capability, so uh, so I'd say to people back back yourself uh, and don't don't think you're going to be taking on IT's job uh, by by being mm. in the room and systems. Where does this potentially go wrong, and where has it? Yeah, you know, where does it need a strong hand to guide the process or set a set a direction? Because I can see you know. Many times decision by committee, decision by, you know, a group can sometimes go awry and may not ultimately fit, especially in this case, the needs of the business or the direction of the business. Maybe, you know, the board has said, look, we're, we're moving out of this service business and we're moving in this direction. Like, uh, talk to me about that. Where, where can it go wrong? What are the, what are the real challenges of getting people to, to recognize what's wrong and then collaboratively coming up with a solution? Right. So, so I think that, uh, that, that there's not a lot of risk when you're talking with people about the job that they're accountable for and they're expected to do. So I'd say that in that regard, there's no risk. But what I think you've highlighted there is that if there is a fundament, fundamental shift in the way the work is going to be done in order to deliver the same results or different results, then this is a different conversation with your stakeholder who says, look, I'd like some training. What would you like some training on? Right. So we need to train people. A great example is, uh, is if you, uh, um, uh, what happened to marketing in the last 15 years? We'd like to train our marketers to be digital marketers. You'll have a look and go, well, that's a fundamentally different job. You wouldn't train that. You'd create mini accelerated apprenticeships and you'd look to seed and amplify uh, a pocket of expertise and know-how and make that more broadly applicable. Perhaps you would do some kind of uh, assessment first to understand where people actually are and then plug them into the resources that are going to help them to guide and support them to do more of the right stuff. So you make a good point. When things are going to change, then you, then it's a different conversation. But if you're looking to improve the way things are, which is, I'd say, it's about 70% of uh, learning and development training requests, then data and evidence will, will help you to zero in on what the actual problems are or the critical points of failure are uh, in the way that people are working and highlight to the people who are responsible for the work because you're not asking them what they will need to be trained on. You're asking them what, like in the context of what they're doing, what they need in order to get that figure upwards. And you've got this stakeholder in the room. So if you've got a room full of people going, uh, well, this is this is uh, accounts fault and it's their fault and it's their fault, you've got a stakeholder going, is any of this your responsibility? Mm. So there is there is a risk of finger pointing, but generally this comes down to uh, you know your your data is not lying. If you are responsible for those numbers and we've got the right people in the room, there is going to be a conversation around we don't have this information or this capability, and that's where you can step in. But as for the conversation, I'd say there's next to no risk. What, what you got to think is what are we up against here? We are up against making huge just taking huge assumptions um uh, so uh, so aggregating learning needs out of, of of secondhand information so people who aren't doing the job managers and leaders uh, aggregating those up to to uh, uh, a higher level of abstraction and then delivering down standardized programs that don't speak to the context in which they work i'd say the way we've been doing learning and development for 25 years is the riskiest you can do it 
if mm. you want to then pivot the conversation to what it is that people are actually doing, you're increasing your chances of uh, of hitting the mark of of zeroing in on making the actual difference required. So data and evidence based practice and these conversations decrease the risk because what we're doing right now investing in platforms and programs there's a report that was published in 2016 called the great training robbery which uh when uh it, it talks then of uh i think it was 162,000 uh, sorry 162 million dollars uh, of spend on training which nick shackleton jones then uh, equated in his book how people learn to, i think to 300 billion dollars of, of training a year right so there's a huge amount of money in this report the great training robbery uh, it it um, uh, uh, states that only 10% of training spend can be equated to demonstrable impact. Wow. Right? You do those maths and you realize that there is $260 billion of waste. And, if, and, and a lot of this is going to be because people make big bets on solutions and they don't know the problems. Hmm. I'd say that, that that data and evidence based practice will start to rectify a lot of the the uh, um, uh, the challenges that we've had in this profession. Okay, so so tough question. Yeah, I'm going to move. Uh, so I'm I'm going to start the question by moving outside the L and D universe for a second, because hmm. I've I've been a consultant. You know that, that was my I was that was my life for a long long time. And I can't tell you the number of times that I went to one of my clients and I said, look, what we don't need is a meeting with 20 people here. Yeah. Right. You're, you're going to fly a whole bunch of people in and we're going to spend two days in a room and we're going to talk. And just the burn rate of the people hours mm -hmm. is going to be half a million dollars. Right. Just the burn rate on the salaries. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you're telling me I've got budget issues and this kind of thing. Like, how much is it that we don't want to hear or we don't want to take make take the uncomfortable choices of this kind of goes back to that 20 percent of people right mm. the uncomfortable choices of actually you actually have to change the behavior right or hey guess what you know that that you know your kind of normal work pattern that you've been going through every day that you're used to and you got that you know your kind of comfortable life and whatnot we're gonna have to change that and break that and mm. so people resist that so hey, how much of this is making tough decisions and doing that in a way that is respectful, but look, we're, you know, we're, we're trying to go that way and where we want, we need to go that way. Do you, do you understand what I'm asking here? Like yeah, yeah. this is, this is the, like you're, you're talking about $260 billion of wasted training. That just sounds like a lot of leaders that weren't willing to do the hard work or take yeah. the tough decision. And I don't want to be so grand as to, you know, I'm on high here and making that, but I've seen it, I've seen it. So what, what's your thoughts on that? I completely agree. So remember, I spent 15 years in house speaking to vendors. I take vendors to stakeholders uh, and say, um, so I used to uh, uh, brief um, vendors on the way up to, to the meeting and say, look, we might not get a lot of time here. What we've got to think about is a, a gold, silver and bronze solution. So the, go the, bronze, the gold solution includes all the analysis. But I know that, uh, that, that there is a reluctance towards analysis. And so you might want to offer the silver and the bronze. And then you hope they go for the middle, which is a modicum of, uh, of, of analysis. But Guy Wallace, uh, uh, who I consider a, a friend and, um, uh, and a mentor, um, he's, he's been doing this stuff since 1979. And he says analysis is one of the hardest things that you'll get through the door. So sometimes you need to do it um uh without without calling it so i mean mm. he'd, he'd laugh because i'd, I'd call sessions of an uh, of analysis discovery thinking that it was it was softer somehow and you might just open the door but um i'd say that uh, um in in the way that i've been describing it here it's first of all i think we're in the zeitgeist i think that 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 so much more business is done with data and I think that um, if we can, uh, and I'm speaking here predominantly to in-house L&D, because I'm afraid that us vendors on the outside will always get uh, parts of briefs. Mm. That, that's never, ever going to change. Mm. But if you're in-house and you're having that conversation and your stakeholder says, I'd like some training for my middle managers, mm -hmm. that's our opportunity. Mm. If we say, if we want to have a training conversation there, we will miss the boat. But if we want to have that, just instead of, you know, if we say, yes, I'd love to help. Could you tell me what you'd look like to achieve? I think that we are not too far and we can help every, they can help every vendor that comes in through the door.
that if we if we simply take the request and we look for the best fit vendor with the best fit solution, we will continue to miss the mark and make just a small amount of impact. And we will deliver what was asked. Mm -hmm. Will we make the impact? Well, we can't because we didn't explore what the impact was. We ended up trying to develop skills without actually discussing what those skills were, were meant to impact. Where, in your opinion, since you've been looking at this forever, and I love the examples that you have, the, the experience that you bring to the table. Wow. Where are we going to see, or how can we affect that that tectonic shift, right? That that the, those plates, you know, like because I'm I'm going to characterize it in this way. We li we we live in a, in an era of data. We live in an era of analysis. We live in an era where if you were to walk into a room and be like, "Yeah, we don't we, we do we do business by the gut," you know, we don't really look at it. You would get laughed out of the room, right? Yeah. And yet, you just said three minutes ago, two minutes ago, you're like, "Look, people, you know, you you would walk vendors in and be like, "Look, you can't. You, you, we're not going to put analysis on the table. We're not going." to in other words, you're saying we're not really going to look at the data. We're not really going to give the actual answer, mm -hmm. right? That people want to hear. That's akin to somebody saying, I, I've, I've often, my mind often goes back to this, where if you were to walk into a party, a dinner party tomorrow, and just, you know, you were just be sitting across me and, you know, you were talking with the person next to you and you, and you guys were talking about finance or something and you say, hey, you know what? Math, that's not my, you know, I've never, never been really good with the numbers. You guys would have a joke, right? You guys would have a little laugh about it and everybody would be like, oh, of course, yeah, yeah. But if somebody were to tell you about, you know, hey, um, you know, it, I didn't read that book because I can't read, mm. right? You would be like, oh, you can't read, right? I feel like this is the kind of conversation that we're having right now in the data world where we're, we're, we, we're, we're, we're almost giving lip service to data to, and to analysis because it's mm. the words that we're supposed to say. It's the image that we're supposed to project. We're collecting lots of data. But how do we make that cultural shift to saying, I can be comfortable with this. I mm. can, I can do this. You know, you know, this is not something that's, that's, this is something that's very knowable. I'm not sure if I couched that question correctly, but how do we make that shift so that even Sally on the front line feels comfortable saying, you know what? I know the numbers. I know how they work. Mm. That's a really good question. And, and I'd say that it's, we do that by not starting with the numbers that if we, if to, to make that shift, uh, we've got to remember what the numbers are for, right? We've got to make sure we're working on the right stuff because by working on the wrong stuff, we can spend an enormous amount of money. We've been talking the enormous amount of money on stuff that just can't meet the mark. So remember, we're not forging any new uh, interactions with our stakeholders. We are, we are just taking it down a different path with our stakeholders. And the role of data in this is just to validate whether this is actually a thing and to what extent it's a thing and who is actually responsible. So, so all we're doing, so, so this comes along, that the whole middle manager thing. We need, I need some training for my middle manager. What is it that they are not doing right now? Well, I don't believe, well, first of all, like, so, so you could say that the ones that have been here longest seem to be um, blocking the path for good, talented people, okay? What's the impact of that? We're losing talented people, mm. right? Can I see the data, right? So what we're doing is we're saying, I just need to see what is actually going on. Now, I don't think it takes too much of a leap to know where to get that data. Right? So, so you would then say, right, could you just get me a, you know, a list of, of those middle managers? I'll run it past HRIS, the HR systems team, who tell, like, will show me who's leaving, what percentage of their teams though, those are, a little bit of their status, you know, some of the important stuff. What was their performance rating? What was their tenure within the organization? Did we have a plan for them? Is this actually a problem with the middle managers? So, so you can see that all you need to do, and there was this brilliant article in Harvard called um, How to Think Like a Data Scientist. And, and really, this is just the application of that. There is an assumption. There's a broad assumption. You need to ask yourself the question, what would I see for this to be true? Mm. What would I what would I be seeing if this weren't true? So these middle managers, I'm having a look and I'm seeing there's absolutely no churn. I've just got disgruntled people who have the ear of my stakeholder thinking like this is a different problem. But mm -hmm. but like, but what would you actually like to do? Um, you know, so so this, this is where it actually starts. This will stop learning and development, spending a great deal of money and wasting their time on. Because you just imagine that I've taken that training request. 
and now I'm, I'm, I'm down the path of a vendor. Uh, the vendor um, then brings their analysis team in and goes, that this could be anything. I've, but so, so I'm pitching you a five-day course, a three-day course, or a two-day course. Right? Okay, so let's go for the three-day. Let's go for the silver. What can we fit in there? Right. So, so what yeah. we do is we crowbar in topics into a program mm -hmm. that won't, that can't possibly hit the mark because we we don't even know whether this is a problem or not. And it could be. I mean, this is the tough one. It could be the stakeholder that's the problem. You know, mm -hmm. they, they, they've not designed uh, an org where there's anywhere for people to go. And so what they want to do is they want to uh, increase the capability of the middle management to try to craft some kind of satisfaction from nowhere. It's like knitting without wool. And like, it's, uh, like, but, but, but you don't know unless you go down that path. Uh, and so this is why I'd say that, that data and evidence is, is absolutely critical, but it doesn't start into your analogy where you know you don't open a book when you can't read and then sort of fumble your way through and then go well i don't like books what you do is you have the conversations to understand what the assumptions are you determine how you would prove or disprove that would be the case and then you just lean on i mean as i said those all of the data i've just stated would be one visit to the hr systems team just mm. one visit with all of those questions and that's it. But you, so you start with an assumption, and then what you believe would prove or disprove that assumption. And I, I think it. that is accessible. So, so take me there. I think many people who are going to be listening to this, um, you know, part of what's in their head is that get that this sounds like a lot of work. This sounds like a lot of time. You know, a lot of investment. Which, at the end of the day, if you're getting a better result, okay, let's do it. But what am I looking at when I'm looking at a collaborative solution? I can't, it's kind of a stupid question. Do I care? Hey, if it, if it gets me where I want to go, then that's what I should do. But what's the different, what, you know, what's the different time investment for an L&D professional doing it the collaborative way? Okay. So, so doing it this way, if you've got, so, so you're speaking to stakeholder and getting the data from, uh, uh, from HR systems and then bringing the, uh, the people responsible for the work together for an exploration session that could take you, um, uh, up to two weeks, and that's mainly to get into people's diaries. Mm -hmm. The conversation of finding the evidence, I think, is likely to to, to uh, have addressed 40, maybe 50% of the actual issue because you've aired the issue in front of all the key people and then you've had a conversation. Everything else is zeroing in on it. It could be, as I said, the, the stakeholder could be taking um, uh, uh, part of that, that role away to deal with procedures, uh, systems, uh, and the like. But, but so you've opened this up. But I would say that the, the majority of this could be uh, you could have a working uh, uh, solution in the hands of the people who need it, either with regular workshops or conversations, 90 minute workshops on a particular topic and digital resources that you would create in house in just a few minutes just to plug those gaps, and that's a few minutes with subject matter experts in your organization. I'd say in three to four weeks, you could have something in the hands of the people, everybody accountable for the work and making a meaningful difference. I would go so far as to say, you wouldn't have even chosen a vendor in that mm. time mm. if you were doing it the traditional way. Mm. Wow. What am I not asking you about this? What are the what are the what are the things that you're most excited about? What are the challenges that you see? Um, you know, as it, it, it sounds like this is it's it's a no brainer. Why would you do it any other way? Like, what are the what are the pieces that you're you know the roadblocks that you're coming up against when you either bring the collaborative solution to a client or you know the 360 platform to a client? Like, what are the what are the what's the pushback? So the pushback is, what do I do with the stuff that I'm doing now? So and my response is that, that what, what I've just described doesn't replace a great deal apart from bad betting like, and fumbling along and trying to make those, those same mistakes. Because if you're not talking about the work, you're not fixing the work. And if what you're doing is you're applying all of your money and energy into developing more learning, then you're creating more noise. So, so, what, so, so the way that I see this is that that you don't ever want to be throwing away anything that works, right? How do you know it works? I always ask the question, how do you know it works? People attend, right? Don't, don't break anything that people are, are, like, uh, consider significant to them. If your courses, your curricula run themselves because you've got good vendors, then you keep them as is. But at the same time, if you've got a presentation skills course that, that, um, uh, that's very popular, but people are rubbish at presenting in your organization, 
you probably want to have a look at your presentation problem and look at it in a data and evidence based manner and then either pull it or, or leave it that later down the line. And as far as online content's concerned, a lot of the time there is an indicator there for you. If people aren't using it, it's not because they don't like online learning. It's not because they don't have time to learn and it's not because they don't know how to learn. It's the clearest indicator that you've got a non-solution there that's fixing a, an L&D engineered problem, which is we don't have online content. Mm. I, they, they, some of the biggest content houses, uh, and we all know what they're called, will struggle for, um, uh, for engagement. And I know because I speak to a lot of, uh, of L&D leaders who say, how do you get people to engage in vendor X? You go, well, if, the, if your people aren't and, and you think the message is out there, your people are giving you a really clear indication that it's not a wholesale solution that's required. Don't get me wrong. There are some great, some great content houses out there that you can subscribe to. But if you're struggling to get any meaningful um, uh, uh, engagement, like when I say meaningful, I mean 1% can be uh, meaningful. But if, you're, if it's not proliferating through your entire organization, it's probably not. Uh, an, uh, a company-wide solution. It's going to be uh, very particular to people who are at certain stages within their career or their job role. So, so I'd say that the, the, the indicators you have should be listened to, but don't go pulling everything out. What you do, I mean, um, uh, anybody who's made a pivot from providing learning to solving business problems does it one conversation at a time. They don't develop the learning culture. They don't get the CEO to get permission. They don't get um, the, the senior leadership to, uh, to give the mandate down. They don't get more uh, line managers engaged and they don't get um, uh, learners to change their expectations or their behaviors or to become more self-directed. They simply work on business problems data, like with, the, with, with requisite data and evidence and then they solve it laser focused till you've got to such a point where your key stakeholders are saying, why don't we do it? Don't, why don't we do it all like this? And you mm. say humbly, that's a great idea. I wish I'd thought that. <laughs> but you don't do it before. There's no there's just no need. You've got to create the groundswell from from key, each key stakeholder at a time. And you gain the currency and the credibility by actually solving the problems uh, and being able to show that you have. Uh, and, I, you know, in, on my podcast, the Learning and Development podcast, I do speak with so many people who have done this and not a single one tried to align the planets before they went ahead. They said they tried it once. It worked. They tried it again. But this time with a little bit more confidence by the third, fourth and fifth time, they're doing it better than they had before. And some of them completely automated the uh, the, the needs extraction uh, process and got total transparency across the organization. So every time uh, a request comes in for training, everyone sees and then it's placed with the uh, with the, with the waiting required what's going to add the greatest value to the organization. So their backlog is completely transparent. Everyone knows what they're working on, and they chew through 200 initiatives a year. Mm. Wow. It's fantastic. I am never uh, – I'm, I'm always surprised at how quickly 45 minutes goes by here. Uh, my final question for you, sir, even though it sounds like there's much more we can chew on here, is what what are you ex most excited about in this particular proposition? Like what – in the in the L&D universe, what's – you know, as you look forward six months, 12 months from now uh, in the near future, what are you psyched about? What is it that, um, you know, you want everyone to, to know about? Is it, it could be a shiny new object. It could be an organization. It could be a, a process. Is there anything that you want to put on the table that is that everyone should check out that you're you're particularly enamored with? Oh, wow. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's, it's quite the question to nail down to one. Um, I so so I'm always excited when I'm speaking to people who are actually at the sharp end of learning and development. Those who are actually changing it from within organisations. So so look, I, if I can plug my podcast, that's those are the people I talk to. They're make, they're making the difference. Uh, nothing lights me up more than somebody who says, "Look, we decided we were going to make this change." Uh, and I was talking with uh, uh, with a with a company uh, just last week uh, who um, uh, who did this pivot uh, and. Um, have changed totally changed the expectation of what L and D can achieve in their organization. And they're going to be taking on a bigger part of the learning and development pie as a result. It is amazing what we can do in our function when we show that we are valuable and we do that by making an actual difference. 
Uh, and so look, I, you know, whether it's on my podcast or, uh, or this podcast or, or, or other great ones out there, listen to the people who are actually making this difference. And I think that's where we get excited. Fantastic. David James, you are the Chief Learning Officer for 360 Learning. Thank you so much for taking time out today to speak with us. Uh, clearly a topic everybody needs to pay attention to, but I, I thank you for taking the time today. Thank you. Thanks again for joining me for the eLearn Podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. Just, just push subscribe on your player right now. And remember, you can join the conversation live on YouTube, Facebook, and my LinkedIn feed every week. I hope to see you there. Thanks.